If the Russians had dumped their diamonds on the market, it might have put an end to the cartel. But in 1957, while De Beers was very publicly opening a new building for its central selling organization in London, the Oppenheimers were very privately beginning to do business with the Russians. Workers gaze with pride at what they have accomplished. Russian diamond production was a problem for the cartel. Russia, the communists, were anathema to the South Africans. Equally, the South Africans were an anathema to the Russians. This created a problem for the cartel because they couldn't be seen to be dealing with the Soviet diamond production. The cartel is an operation that's well used to cloaking their business operations in mystery. They simply set up a separate operation owned by a UK merchant bank across the street from their offices. The diamonds would appear to have found their way into the central selling organization without a problem. By the 1980s, Russian diamonds were pouring quietly through London into the market. Harry Oppenheimer's son-in-law was seen at the Bolshoi. Officially coming from South Africa, he could not even have had an entry visa. Thank you. No, no, thank you very much. Like no. what, what you were doing in Moscow. No. I just throw away your being thoroughly unreasonable. You spoke to me politely and I said, no, I have nothing to say. Thank you very much. Do you not think it's interesting? No. I have nothing to say. Were you just there for the ballet? The other interesting feature of the Russian diamond production was that there was an extraordinarily large proportion of medium-sized stones in the quarter to half carat size. De Beers then came up with perhaps one of the great new product inventions in, in jewelry history, the Eternity Ring, a ring that was designed to use up this excessive production of low-sized stones. And it is perhaps amusing to think that at the height of the Cold War, the Eternity Ring that was being so successfully marketed in America was filled with stones from Siberia. As the Soviet Union became an important source of small stones, the problem for the diamond industry became finding cutters willing to work for low enough wages to make these stones profitable. India soon developed into the world's greatest cutting center. There are 750,000 cutters in workshops around Surat. Perhaps 100,000 of them, children under 13. They place 58 exact cuts on a diamond less than half a carat, smaller than a broken pencil lead. Many children work a 12-hour day, six days a week. They earn four cents a stone. The Indian diamonds have made it possible to make low-priced jewelry. It looks like a lot. It's called more flash for less cash. This is the expression that's used in the industry, and this seems to be the trend. We perceive popular retail price points to top out at about $500. This is what most of our customers are demanding now, and starting as low as $75, $80. We just got in some new samples today. These are examples. Here's a ring that sells for $70. There is two dollars worth of diamond in this ring. But the fact that we can market it as an article with a genuine diamond makes it more saleable. Here's another ring. This is a ninety dollar ring. There's a dollar diamond in here. It's a white finish that makes it appear like diamonds. There's only one diamond in the center. Diamonds were discovered in 1979 at Australia's Ashton Mine. The cartel machinery mobilized once again to bring this new find, the largest ever, into the fold. Until then, the cartel had co-opted diamond sources largely in Russia and African countries. Could they repeat the success in a country that was modern and democratic? In the Ashton project certainly had huge reserves which if it had gone into independent hands would certainly have challenged to be as monopoly 
Now, I know that the Indian government had made representations to Australia to uh, take over the marketing. I myself uh, met with one independent uh, diamond trader who uh, was visiting from, uh, from London, and he was also uh, putting in his bid and trying to persuade the Australian government that, uh, in fact, uh, as I said, there were enormous benefits for Australia and it was not in the interest to further reinforce a monopoly. But De Beers pressured Australia by threatening to reduce diamond prices in the categories of stones the new mine would produce. At the same time, the Oppenheimers bought stock in key Australian companies. De Beers chairman, Harry Oppenheimer, flew in to cement alliances, and the cartel began to lobby the government and mold public opinion. Many Australian journalists were invited to South Africa, sponsored by De Beers, to um, go on uh, I suppose uh, tours which were meant to promote uh, De Beers' image and soften the impact of De Beers' penetration into the Australian economy. And soon after those tours took place, it became quite evident in the Australian media, mainly through the newspapers, that there was... CSO uh, approach being doctored by the media. So I think De Beers' strategy worked quite well in that they'd softened up the Australian media and the media uh, reciprocated by promoting uh, very favourable stories to the De Beers' takeover of the Ashton project. After a major political battle, the cartel scored a crucial victory. The bulk of Australia's output, mainly industrial grade and small gemstones, would flow through the cartel's central selling organization in London. A small number of rare gemstones, known as the Argyle Pinks, were Australia's own to market independently. They produce a variety of colors, which is very unique to this mine, and uh, out of the 36 million carats come some of the rarest diamonds in the world. The extraordinary thing is nature's thrown up these freaks, which are just unique and special. And, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, something that we're all madly trying to get hold of, can't get enough of. If you look at this uh, small, very intense pink from Argyle, and it's only, I think it's about 18 points, and then you compare it against this two character from Argyle, the two character is worth about $22,000. Now, if we could superimpose that color on that small pink into that uh, two character, that two character would be worth at least a million dollars in today's market. Now, Argyle only gets maybe three, four, five of those stands a year maximum out of, remember, 35, 36 million carats of diamonds. The De Beers operation is essentially the control of the production of diamonds. They control the chain of supply of diamonds, and that's the way in which they control the diamond market. If somebody were to try to go around the cartel, the concern that they would have to have is how long it would last. Because, of course, De Beers in the past has been very successful at bringing all the producers into the cartel. Today, a century after it began, the diamond cartel still controls the production, the marketing, and the pricing of rough diamonds around the world. But that world is changing, and there are new threats to the Oppenheimer's dominance of the diamond trade. In its largest market, the United States, the cartel cannot operate openly. Its monopolistic control of the worldwide diamond trade violates U.S. antitrust laws. Section 1 of the Sherman Act uh, says every contract combination or conspiracy in restraint of trade is hereby declared to be unlawful. The Sherman Act, in effect, says that as long as you have enough competitors and as long as they act independently, 
the public interest will be